so so we're on the hour at this stage uh where we're a small but perfectly formed group um maybe okay do, i i don't want to i i probably would suggest that that maybe we should just just uh get on get get on get on with things that you know just uh don't want to uh, unless people feel like we want to hang on for for a few more minutes for 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 more people oh hang on there's some more people coming along i'm, I'm speaking too soon Hello to everybody else who's 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 just arrived. If it's okay, let's just give people one more minute to 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 to, to settle in, and then uh, then we'll get we'll get started. All right, Hugh, you have the host privileges, mm. and all the other speakers are co-host. Lovely. The session is recording, so you are set to go whenever you feel like you'd like to start. Alrighty. Great. Thank you very much. No okay. Problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So at this stage, why don't we just, why don't we get, 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 get cracking then. Um, for those of you who have just arrived again, I'll just sort of pop into the chat. The, there's a Google doc, which has just got the, which has just got the, the notes for today. Um, let me, if it's okay, I'm just going to share my screen for just a moment. So um, we'll just, so just as a, uh, if if you could, if possible, thank you, just put in your details below, that would be really great. Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to say a few words from myself. By the way, my name is Hugh Shanahan. Um, and then we'll have some 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 further talks, which are which 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 will carry on. So if it's okay, I'm just going to just go to my very quick presentation here. Um, okay, I hope everybody can see that. Okay, so. Uh, Thanks for coming along to uh, today, this evening's uh, BOF on computational notebooks. Um, just I wanted to sort of set the terms here in some respect uh, uh, in terms of what do we mean by notebooks here. Um, and the easiest way of describing that is saying, okay, just to provide examples of them. So in particular, the one that probably everybody has kind of got in their mind are Jupyter notebooks, but also we've got uh, or Studio notebooks as a, as a, as 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 another example that's that's there, and that the key point here is that they're examples of of literate programming where um, uh, your code, your text, your visualizations, and so on are all sitting in one document and by extension you tend to have your data sort of sitting in the same with within the same place at the same time um, the reason why I'm just being a little bit careful here in terms of 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 definitions is is it, and just to make clear that what we're what we're not talking about here are electronic lab notebooks which are a very very different beast altogether um, this isn't the first time that we ran a, a boff on this. Uh, 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 and actually, if you look in the, the notes, we, we put together a fairly extensive set of follow-up notes on the discussion that was there. Um, the topics were similar to the ones that we'll be talking about now. And indeed, um, if you look at the GitHub page that's there, there's actually um, a proposal to set up an interest group. And that was all kind of like, Done and dusted and ready and like okay let's let's move on and then well COVID happened and then suddenly we all had 101 other things to do at this at this at this at the same time. So if 
just to move back to the uh, um, the agenda for today, um, if it's okay, we'll start off with uh, Martin Fenner from DataSight. So he'll be talking about his date, the, the experiences of using note notebooks from DataSight, from DataSight, and some further thoughts that 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 he has there. Um, Patricia Herterich from DCC is going to be talking about archiving and preserving notebooks, and this is something that 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 um, Patricia and Rosie Hickman and I have been have been trying to make progress on, and 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 Patricia will give us an update there. Inal Fernandez from from EGI will be talking about big data and compute and using that in in terms of um, for for again Jupyter notebooks, and then. Um, uh, Kenton McHenry from NCSA is coming in, uh, and many thanks again for coming in at, at, at late notice, who's going to give us an update of an experience of the EarthCube meeting and uh, publishing notebooks there. These are all meant to be relatively short talks, um, um, uh, about five minutes, and the idea is, is to allow room for, for the discussion that follows. In other words, quite points that we can sort of follow up on on here, um, and it, you know, and also, even though we've sort of set up this, you know, there's the paperwork is in some respect all done for an interest group. It's just to say, okay, should we just press return on that and get that get that sent off, or or how to how to how how we think the best to 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 go forward on that. So. Without further ado, I do. I will. I'll stop sharing here, and if it's okay, I'm going to first pass over to uh, Martin, uh, and I'll let him uh, uh, get started. I can you are, are you okay with that, Martin? Sure. Um, yeah. Because we wanted to keep things short. It's above, after all. I will not have slides and just um, talk about a few things, which is sort of. Uh, continuation of the last buff, which is um, both myself and my organization data side is interested in metadata identifiers for notebooks and connect to that uh, publishing notebooks, um, which I don't have the answer for the publishing part. That's surprisingly difficult, or maybe it's not because notebooks are really things that are very much work in progress. And I want to um, give a short update on, on three topics. The first one is metadata for notebooks. And for me, at the end of the day, a notebook is software. So it's, it's a sort of special beast, but it's probably closer to uh, source code and executable code than to text documents that you read. And, and for that reason, um, we can start with using the same metadata that we use for software and source code in general, where we have a sort of evolving community standard called code meta. Um, just a quick, well, I don't know, raise of hands is difficult. Is that code meta something that's familiar to most of you or is that not, not so? Yep. yep. Okay, so, so mix, maybe we can discuss this, but basically um, the code meta started out I think five years ago, four years ago, as a as a sort of Rosetta Stone of uh, crosswalking the different metadata standards for uh, source code, looking at very different places, everything from what the R or Python community is doing to metadata for scholarly content, and then uh, provided crosswalks and code meta. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure whether it's codemeta.org or IO. Um, is providing these crosswalks um, and then, but then it involved like what was happens with metadata. It, it created its own metadata standard. That's sort of the combination of all these things. And that this has further evolved. Then it became sort of picked up properties from schema.org. And what I have been involved in as part of the Force 11 software uh, citation implementation working group is that we started a task force. Thank you, Patricia. Um, to basically turn code meta into 100% schema.org as a way of being, becoming part of a larger community and sort of having um, 
better integration of tools, other people using it, etc. And we are, um, again, maybe because of COVID-19, it took us longer than we thought, but we're getting close to the finish line. There are a few things in code meta that obviously are not in schema.org yet. And that was basically our task to sort of make a proposal for these 10 properties that are missing. And I think one was created in schema.org since, and, and two are just more flexible to how you name things. And that should um, be finished, hopefully, by the end of the year, as far as the code beta proposals. Schema.org, if you know this community, um, it's quite open, but it's quite unpredictable whether this is then something that sort of easily makes it into schema.org and then code matter is a subset of schema.org or whether this becomes a discussion that takes longer. But at least it's it's a standard that's quite generic that everyone can use. And there is sort of uh, not enough, but there's also tooling to generate this because it's it's probably still too painful to for example, if you have source code and then you want to generate a code meta uh, file, uh, put this in your repository, that's still a little bit hard. And um, there, there's definitely, that's one of the areas where more, where more is needed. <clears throat> the second um, update I want to give is sort of now with my data side hat on that we will have a new metadata schema released in January, and this will biggest change is better support for text documents so that you can say um, in sort of we have a sort of control vocabulary of currently 15 content types one of them is software one of them is text and the letter is very generic obviously and we will add sort of about 10 more all flavors of text documents um, the usual suspects but there's also things like data management plan and um, computational notebooks, which we hope makes them a little bit more visible in, in discovery tools and, and, and uh, identifying and finding them and, and doing hopefully cool things with them. That's obviously for the really enormous number of computational notebooks, there's obviously a very small number yet that uses um, data side device as identifiers. And finally, I want to report on an activity that we did in a European grant funded project in the last few months, a project called Freya, which is all about identifiers and metadata. And we um, wrote quite a number of computational notebooks, in particular 10, where we had somebody basically spent three months on it to really document them and make them reusable. And they're all about what we built in this Freya project called Pit Graph, which is um, scholarly resources connected in a graph. And that's sort of another story. But the important piece is we use these notebooks to basically query and visualize this graph. And then, um, of course, we also register these notebooks using code meta and using UI metadata, and they are now part of this graph because notebooks have people who wrote them, contribute to them. They have orchids, we have grant funding, we have data sets generated, etc. So that's just an example, and that's quite generic. You can do this with data sets with other content types. But computational notebooks, of course, can also be linked to other content, and that's the part of metadata that is particularly interesting for data side. If we think, for example, about publishing notebooks, that obviously you want to see connected to the things connected to them. And that, of course, also includes versions, et cetera. So this is just, it was a, a small exercise, if you will, but it's just sort of what we knew before, but that notebooks are really a good fit, not only for the kind of things that notebooks are good at, but also for demonstrating using metadata, using identifiers, and, and working with them. And I stop here. Brilliant. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks. Thanks a lot there, Martin. Um, is there any chance uh, to find those 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 notebooks um, uh, for the PID graph? Uh, can you can you can you pop a link into the into the chat there, or should you, do you, will you just find them on the data site site on the data no, no, site? I, uh, yeah, not having slides. I, I can um, 
see what I can put in the Google Doc in the chat so that you can just follow links and, and learn more. And like all good notebooks there in or most are GitHub and they are linked to my binder so you can run them without installing, etc. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Just to uh, sit. Good. Yeah. All right. Does any does anybody else does anybody have any 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 immediate questions at this point for for Martian? Uh, well, I, I just uh, just a quick thing to say if uh, it, people shouldn't feel shy, you know, don't you know about we won't worry about raising hands and stuff like this. We'll assume that people are are going to behave. Okay. Um, if if not, uh, uh, thanks uh, thanks a lot, Martin. Um, we'll move over to to uh, Patricia and the the archiving and preserving notebooks. Are you are you okay with that, Patricia? Yeah, if I can figure out all the sharing of things and Zoom setup. No, not not that one. Not that sharing present in this part. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Patricia, uh, I work uh, for the Digital Creation Center based at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a librarian by training and um, so is uh, Rosie, who I'm like presenting on behalf of um, here doing, doing the night shift from the UK. Um, and because we're both like like coming from the library side, um, archiving and preservation is kind of our interest uh, topic because we feel that like uh, you know a lot of lecturers at uh, the university increasingly use uh, notebooks uh, in their in their teaching. Um, actually, the University of Edinburgh uh, is running their own um, uh, computational notebook service offering. Um, but we feel that like, you know, unlike other material that, that is used in training and research, um, the archiving and preservation part isn't necessarily thought of yet. Um, I think I've seen some familiar faces and names in the room. So apologize, I apologize for those who have, still have like really good memories from the um, uh, session in Helsinki last year. Uh, I added in a little throwback slide and that was um, my, my starting point back then. Um, that basically, if you think about uh, preserving a computational notebook, you can do that on on various level. You can basically transfer uh, for into a PDF and a text file that uh, takes a while. All all the interaction um, that you actually might use a notebook for, but then that's a, a standard piece, a standard document that um, most of the preservation systems can deal with. Um, you can preserve it in, in a way that you can view it and that um, all the in interactive parts, at least the results of those, uh, um, for like images or videos or anything that um, might be created are um, preserved separately. And um, you do have um, projects uh, such as, as Binder that to a degree um, are looking into um, keeping the notebooks actionable and but then like preservation we talk about like a, a timeline of, of month and uh, when librarians and archivists uh, are talking about preservation we are uh, more looking at like 10 years um, which we're still a bit away from. So this is basically the, the starting point uh, um, that I gave like Gosh, more than a year ago, um, thinking of what we do, if this is relevant at all. And it turned out in um, Helsinki that that um, uh, actually resonated with people. And uh, there was some interest to uh, also on uh, our end of the people who uh, suggested this as a topic to explore this in practice. Um, so when um, Microsoft Azure Notebooks uh, announced that um, that they will retire their service. We thought that's actually quite a nice use case to make the point uh, of a service that might have been used um, by uh, quite a few 
researchers that we could um, grab things at this stage um, and see if we can preserve some of them in, in local preservation systems. So um, the plan was to team up with the archiving and preservation teams in, in our institutions. Um, both Ozzy and I were based at universities and uh, they usually have like teams that are looking at uh, the, the preservation of um, digital objects. And um, they do have a preservation software um, like the Rosetta Archivematic and Preservica are kind of the three big brands that are usually used uh, in connection with uh, repositories uh, to do the preservation workflows. So uh, our idea was to team up with people, run some of these notebooks um, through standard workflows um, and see um, what what happens if we don't um, play around with the settings, but then um, actually start exploring adjustments of, uh, for, for preservation workflows to see um, how they you know, might need to change to accommodate a computational notebook to get better results. And the idea was that that then um, would result in a, a little writing sprint short paper about best practice, do's and don'ts, um, and that especially like um, as, as something that's interesting for the uh, community of preservation practitioners like software and um, things like notebooks aren't, the, aren't that high on the, on the radar in that community. And uh, we thought that would be quite a nice way to bring those people in that have the preservation expertise and connect them with um, some of their um, yeah, more no novel research outputs that um, are created. In reality, um, we didn't get anywhere, basically. Um, the, the people that we got in touch with were all um, interested and fairly enthusiastic, but we're also still in a pandemic. Uh, people are busy. They had to um, adjust to provide a lot of services uh, in different ways. Um, quite a lot of the people we, um, we talked to that were interested had people leave their teams. And um, uh, because it's a pandemic, there are hiring freezes. So basically there's even less capacity to do it. Um, so nothing practical has, has happened yet um, because basically no one had time to do anything. Um, even for like people like Rosie um, and myself, this is basically also just a side project um, that we get around to um, when you know there's uh, nothing else to do, which basically ha never happens, um, and we don't really have like direct access to those systems that we would run um, that that would. Um, run those preservation workflows so we can't really do anything without the help from other people. So basically if uh, people are up for a little discussion, um, yeah, the question is how do we fix the situation that we're in? Um, some of that might be that, you know, is there anyone who would who would fund an exercise like this? Could we um, incentivize uh, people with, with money? Um, to help us out? Um, could we change the pitch and um, provide something else that uh, gratitude and potentially uh, authorship on a paper if this gets, ready, um, gets written up? Or is um, the idea that we're trying to pull off uh, a stupid idea in the first place? And should we do something completely different or um, set the whole preservation topic aside for the moment. So that's it from me. I think I've seen things pop up in the chat, but I'm not entirely sure how I'd get there. Right. I think that's Martian is ah, okay. being, he's being busy with, with, with your just providing sort of useful useful links. So um, does anybody have any any questions 
uh, any any just immediate follow up questions? We, you know, we'll have time for a discussion after after the talks. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, if it's okay, thanks again. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, that, 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 yeah, that's a good summary of the, of the situation there. Um, so, if it's okay, I'll, I'll um, we'll, we'll move on to to, to Enol from from the EGI. Um, you know, you 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 okay with with getting yourself um, uh, set up there? Yep. Let me Breath. try to share my screen. Uh. I hope you can you can see it. Um, yeah. So I prepare a small presentation on what we are doing in EGI, and, and I was doing a bit of exploration of what's going on in the let's say in the HPC world. Uh, EGI itself is not uh, delivering HPC as such. We are more in, into the infrastructure, service, cloud, or high throughput computing, but we have overall good links with HPC Center. So I, I try to figure out a bit what's what's going on on, on that area also. Um, so starting with EGI, I don't know if you're familiar with that. We are basically a, a service provider for, for research, providing, yeah, supporting any kind of research activities in, in, in Europe, mainly looking for, for international collaborations. And we have several services, and one of them is, is the CGI notebooks that we uh, moved into production uh, last year. And the idea is that we want to support people uh, for running these this notebooks because we have seen there is a growing trend of people using this kind of format, and, and they are constantly asking, hey, how can I run uh, notebooks in, in the EGI uh, infrastructure? So we started delivering the, the service the idea is to make it as easy as possible to use. Uh, just logging in there and, and you will have to. So I, I think it's similar to the Azure Notebooks that was uh, the commission. So we are trying to provide a similar uh, service. And what we are trying to do like a bit different is trying to integrate with uh, with uh, technologies or, or yeah, or other platforms for, for big data and, and compute. So it's not just that you have a place where you can run your notebooks. From there, you can also access uh, big data storage or, or repositories. And we have, uh, first thing we have is the CGI Data Hub, which is a distributed uh, uh, solution for, for storing big data. I, will, I have one slide on that. But we also try to, to look into other solutions, mostly in the research area, because that's where we move. So we have B2Drop from UDAT, which is a kind of uh, Dropbox service. Uh, D4Science, which is a virtual research environment. They have also some kind of storage there and we integrate with them. And, and we have played a bit with some communities and, and if they have anything, in storage that can be exposed as volumes in Kubernetes, we have played around to, to make that happen and make it available in, in the service. So we are quite open to to listen to what people need and, and try to accommodate that. And one thing that it's, I think it's it's nice, it's not just that you have the the this kind of predefined services integrated, this data hub, it drop, etc. We also have um, included into into the service, uh, uh, our, our refreshal mechanism for the identities. So at any time you will have a valid token that you can use to access uh, any other service. This is just small code snippet. Maybe it's not very relevant, but it's just reading the token and accessing another kind of uh, EGI provider to get, in this case, a, serve, a list of servers. So the idea that we want to promote here is that it's not a closed system. You can connect to other stuff and try to, to deliver whatever you want to deliver in, in the notebooks as, as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. Just some comments on this uh, data hub, this other service that we have in EGI. Uh, how it works is basically it, uh, it's able to, to have like a distributed uh, collection of providers that uh, they call the one providers, it's calling technology. 
So this hosts the data and the this central piece here, the one sum, is able to understand where each data is located. And when you read the data from the notebooks, uh, it, the data will be moved accordingly so you can access directly as, as a regular POSIX file system. So it's quite convenient because you don't need to change anything in your workflow, let's say. Uh, and it will be, and it allows you to access uh, data from, from remote sites. And this is something that people ask a lot. How can I, I have the notebooks? Now I, I want to access data that is located some, somewhere else. So how do I do it? And, and this is one solution that we are providing. So this is kind of the EIS offer. And, and I've been looking into the HPC uh, world. Um, I found there was a quite interesting workshop last year in, in, in the US about Jupyter in HPC. Uh, there were a lot of contents and, and, and I extracted mostly kind of two main ways of interacting with HPC in the notebooks. The first one would be running Jupyter directly in the HPC system. So it's like a job that you submit, you start the Jupyter notebook and you connect to that. Uh, there are solutions included in Jupyter Hub for doing that uh, with the spawner, but there are also kind of more manual or semi-automated uh, solutions. One, one thing that people is doing is, for example, this is from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. They have the solution called COMPS, uh, uh, COMPS Super Scalar, and they have a notebook ready version. So the idea is that they start this uh, notebook on, on my Nostrum, the supercomputer at Barcelona. And from there, you interact uh, with, the, with the hardware using the, the notebooks. And, and it seems quite, quite successful. One thing to be taken into account in this approach is that HPC systems normally have a lot of restrictions. For example, external collect, uh, connections are not allowed. So probably you cannot so easily connect your browser to the HPC system. Uh, you probably cannot download data for, for analysis when you submit this kind of uh, notebooks. So this is something that works, but um, you need to be careful what you do and, and how you do it. So let's say the second approach that I have seen is that uh, people just offload some part of the notebooks from the notebook to the HPC. And there, there, there seems to be like a, um, a, a winner, I would say, as far as I can see in, in, in the technologies for doing that, that which is Dask. It's a, a library that parallelizes Python code. So basically you can, you can have some NumPy uh, operations and Dask will, will transform that into jobs into a batch queue. So you can submit that to the HPC. And there are others that uh, I have just two examples from last week that I will show. And one thing that I, I was wondering, maybe this is a question for, for the group, is, is whether people is, is running the whole notebook as a batch job. So not having like an interactive thing, but submitting the notebook and that just getting back the result and, and visualizing it, which is something that should be easy to do, but I don't know if, if it's really relevant or not. But when doing the slide, I thought, well, maybe that's, that's something that may interest uh, someone. So just to show two examples of what people is doing, this is from two examples from, from some user communities that were presenting last, uh, last week in the EI conference. So this is some people from the, uh, this is one high performance data analytics frameworks uh, focused on, cli on climate uh, research. And they have this kind of uh, library where they start a job into the HPC system and then get back the results. And this other uh, on the right is from the Embry uh, community. This is environmental sciences. And what they do is from, from the Jupyter notebook, they are able to extract the cells and create a Docker container just for the cell and deploy that cell in a, in a cloud environment. And, and the idea is that then they can execute that cell uh, as, as they want with some parameters and so on. So this is what people are, uh, at least what in the EGI uh, environment people are doing for interacting with HPC. Basically, they have the, 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 their main notebook and from there, they send some computation to the HPC. 
Um, so this was just a very short uh, thing. Um, as a summary, we, we are seeing this increased demand of the notebooks and the infrastructure and the HPC. It's actually one of the most popular services that we get requests from in the EGI marketplace. Uh, but we are also getting more uh, question like, hey, can I can I access HPC like hardware, especially GPUs, which are quite uh, um, useful in, in, in artificial intelligence and so on. We have seen that there are multiple approaches here for for interacting with the with the HPC, uh, at least from from my my EGI hat on. Uh, we would like to see. Or we would like to understand what what we need to support for for making our service useful. For, for um, as many people as, as possible. So, so if let's say if this group uh, has a like a good or um, best practices on how to write notebooks, that would be really helpful because we would try to implement that in in, in whatever service that we offer. Um, and we also see that it's not just access to computational resources. So, I think we also need to take into account that. Notebooks normally access some data. That data needs to be accessible, open, and so on. So, fair is quite important here. Data, uh, I mean, if the data is not fair, it's, it's really not that useful for, for, for mainly reproducing or replicating the ideas on the notebooks, and and also connected a bit to to the previous presentation from Patricia. I think we also need to, to make sure that we are able to pro provide the right computational environment for reproducing the notebooks. Something like Binder could work, but uh, and when looking into HPC, again, you need to consider that not everything is allowed. So probably Docker is something that will not be allowed in HPC. You can look into other similar solutions like Singularity and so on. But, okay, so something to consider. Uh, what's the right uh, technical solution for enabling this kind of reproducibility in, in HPC. And yeah, that was me. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Inal. Um, that's, 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 that's excellent. Um, so there's a question from Tom, uh, Tom Honeyman. Um, Tom, if you want to say something, uh, if you if you want to kind of raise that, or or uh, uh, I'll uh, wait until all the talks are done. Uh, that's, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's not for one person. That one. Okay, that's 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 cool. Okay, so we'll save that for for the discussion. We'll make sure we'll get that that fitted in. Does anybody have any any sort of brief questions uh, uh, for for Enol at this stage? Okay. So uh, uh, if that's all right, then um, we'll move on to um, the, the, the last talk, which is from uh, Kenton McHenry from NCSA, which is talking about the, the, their experiences in terms of uh, publishing notebooks. Great. So over to you, Kenton. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. So uh, I'm Kenton McHenry, and I'm the director of software at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And what I'm going to talk about right now is our uh, effort with the uh, uh, NSF EarthCube program. Uh, we're part of their office, which coordinates a lot of the activities that are happening uh, within the EarthCube right now. And our uh, activity that we did the last this year, actually, uh, with regards to our first call for notebooks as part of a published artifact for our annual meeting. So just a quick bit of background, uh, if you haven't heard of EarthCube in the US, uh, um, basically what it is is a program to advance uh, the cyber infrastructure in support of geoscience research. Uh, it's a collaboration between the Geoscience Directorate and the Office of Cyber Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation. Uh, and it, it has a lot of activities and funds a lot of activities around developing tools, data resources, infrastructure, around data sharing, interfaces, data wrangling, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and over the past uh, number of years, it started roughly around 2012, it's funded roughly 80 projects uh, to date, uh, leveraging many other activities happening across the NSF space uh, as well. So with regards to that, there's always been this challenge, and it's not just within EarthCube, but I would say broadly, uh, with regards to the developed uh, code and software in regards to sustainability uh, and exposure, making sure people are aware of it and that can actually use it. And so, as with many things, there's gaps there uh, in terms of lack of awareness of uh, you know what's been built uh, previously, and that leads to duplications of efforts, uh, limitations on uh, 
uh, the interoperability, that's an important thing if you want to kind of connect up these components to build larger things. Uh, and so uh, uh, interoperability is a key to that. Uh, and uh, uh, an unfortunate aspect of many of these funded investments basically ending when the project ends. Uh, there's a, a large push to address sustainability post award, uh, becoming an open source project, building a community, things like that, but it doesn't always happen. And that's, that's a huge loss. Um, software that's at various states of readiness, some of it's more raw, some of it's closer to production, things like that. Uh, various levels of support and documentation, to, you know, allowing for reuse, you know, the, the principles with regards to FAIR, uh, uh, and so on. So the office has uh, always been concerned about this and trying to deal with that. Past efforts have included uh, things that have been done on a number of other efforts as well, building catalogs. Uh, and so there's this EarthQ tools inventory as one example, which try to catalog some of the EarthQ funded efforts and this uh, resource registry, which was developed by the EarthQ office uh, in the past. Uh, to catalog uh, more tools broadly that are just relevant to geoscience. One drawback with regards to these things is that uh, it requires a central body to kind of maintain them. It's always incomplete uh, and things like that. And so that's that was a challenge. And so with regards to that, uh, and uh, there was another aspect of this as well, is they wanted to, you know, the, the ability to actually execute some of these tools, not just know that they exist, but facilitating that executability of these things. So uh, Dave Volker on the technical architecture committee for the EarthCube program, um, uh, you know, had this idea of, you know, in terms of low hanging fruit, could we do something with uh, notebooks uh, to kind of capture and document, you know, software that's being developed out there. Uh, and this through a number of discussions with uh, the leadership committee uh, in the office uh, and others, uh, it, it was the idea was thrown out that you know you want community buy-in you want them to actually if you want to remove the central body the office from the equation uh, for this to sustain beyond the earth cube program itself you really need the community to be part of this to do this on their own and so this idea of uh, uh making it something that's worthy of being called a scholarly object came to light and the idea that if it was something that was um peer-reviewed citable something you could, uh, a scholar could put on their cv that it might in, you know, induce folks to proactively themselves go ahead and you know, build a notebook around their software, documenting it and, and submitting it. And so we had this idea of a call for notebooks. So uh, for our, we have an annual meeting each year as part of EarthCube. And so for this year's annual meeting, we made this call for notebooks the main um, mechanism for submitting uh, 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 papers instead of papers, notebooks to the meeting with the idea that they would be peer reviewed and those that were accepted published. And so this is the call here, and it, and it was a bit of an experiment to see what would uh, happen. We were hoping it would be successful. Um, and it, to a large degree, it, it was. Uh, I think we were all pleasantly surprised. So uh, uh, I'll just outline some of the key aspects of this. So with regards to the submission as, uh, uh, process around this, uh, we would just ask folks to basically submit an abstract and a link to a notebook hosted somewhere on the web. Uh, we did this just because it allowed us to leverage our current uh, uh, system for submitting uh, papers and posters uh, without to, uh, any more modifications. So it allowed us to leverage that. Uh, in terms of the notebook type, we left it completely open-ended because it was an experiment. And so uh, we suggested, you know, obviously Jupiter, R, R uh, even MATLAB, things like that. We didn't, we didn't really uh, make a restriction there. Uh, at the end of the day, we actually received a good number uh, for, you know, uh, our first run of this. So we got 21 submissions uh, and they spanned uh, not just geoscience, but cyber infrastructure as well. So, uh, uh, and it included efforts within EarthCube and outside of EarthCube, which is a good thing. So uh, efforts that were relevant to geoscience uh, that could be uh, um, highlighted as well. What was interesting is that they were all Jupiter, every single one of them. Uh, and so the, for future uh, uh, calls for notebooks, uh, we might actually make that restriction because it would facilitate reviewing uh, if uh, reviewers didn't have to worry about multiple ways of doing it. And with regards to the review process, we basically had two to three reviews per notebooks, uh, per notebook. And these are the reviewers that uh, were, uh, did this. Uh, they span both geoscience and cyber infrastructure. I think both are kind of critical uh, understanding of the science uh, and it's understanding of the technologies are out there as, as well. Uh, the organizers of the event, the folks showed above, myself, Dan Katz, Dave Fulker, and Lynn Schreiber, uh, we were the organizers of this, and we basically, after the reviews came in, we uh, discussed the notebook reviews and made final decisions with regards to um, who we would accept. Uh, we ended up accepting 12, uh, 12 of the notebooks uh, based on impact to geoscience uh, research uh, and overall usability. That was actually pretty uh, important at the end of the day. 
uh, and five were accepted as oral presentations that were presented uh, uh, at the annual meeting. Um, with regards to presentations, again, we left it open-ended just to kind of see what people would do. Uh, and as one could expect, there was a bit of a mixture of uh, ways people presented the notebooks. Some of them just did PowerPoint presentations. Some of them actually walked through their notebooks uh, kind of in a live uh, session. Uh, that wasn't always the case though, because some of the notebooks did require uh, a significant uh, data set or computational resources backing it. And so they weren't exactly real time. Uh, and others did a mixture of both. Uh, as an example there on the bottom right uh, of uh, one, one author basically kind of having the notebook next to some of the visualizations provided there. Uh, and folks could go to this YouTube URL here to uh, kind of actually see the presentations uh, that were presented. Uh, and lastly, with regards to publication. So uh, we had a number of uh, thoughts on this. So one, of, one of the obvious ones was uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, within, well, first of all, we set up a GitHub repository uh, to kind of host the notebooks. You can see it here, uh, that's the URL and what it looks like, uh, where somebody can go and actually get each and every of the notebooks. It shows the abstract and so forth. But with regards to publication, archival purposes, the DOI to cited by, uh, we explored a number of options. One was uh, obviously Zenodo. Uh, to mint that DOI. Uh, another was Joss, the Journal of Open Source Software, uh, who we were working with. Dan Katz is one of the founders of that. Uh, he was working with us closely with regards to that, but it entailed us kind of setting up some of our own uh, software to host some of those notebooks, which, you know, given that the program from uh, NSF EarthCube may not, you know, live forever, uh, that wasn't desirable. Uh, and one of the options we looked at also was the AGU uh, in terms of recognized publisher uh, uh, hosting the uh, uh, published artifacts of that. At the end of the day, we did end up going with AGU, uh, largely because of that, they are a recognized publisher. Um, and so we use their e-source system, uh, which is largely for preprints, but they, they do mint DOIs and they allow you to cite things. And they worked with us. Um, uh, so they actually moved up their time scale to actually support notebooks. They were, that was in on their, uh, uh, um, uh, they were working on that as is anyway. Uh, and so uh, basically it allows us to uh, upload notebooks as an artifact with regards to these abstracts submitted there. And so we basically had them uh, uploaded uh, and they generated the DOI uh, layer. So uh, this is my last slide there. We got a number of insights from this experience. Uh, one is, one is it, it kind of worked out. So I think we're gonna do it again uh, and hopefully uh, more folks in the community do this. It's a nice way of capturing the, the software uh, and the documentation around the software in a manner that's actually runnable. Uh, one key aspect that we did learn is with regards to reviews, that runnability, that executability was absolutely critical in terms of reviewing that notebook. And so we didn't specify uh, much beyond the notebook when we did the call for notebooks, but in the future, we're thinking we would uh, to kind of support that. So, you know, something like Binder uh, uh, and having that environment captured there would be so useful. Uh, and Jupyter has this new Jupyter book uh, capability as well that you know, seems very interesting in terms of turning notebooks into really full papers with citations and things like that. Uh, formatting guidelines is something that uh, would have been nice as well. Uh, we didn't uh, specify that, but uh, an, an author submitted things that look, you know, different in terms of uh, titles, abstracts, sections that were citations, things like that. So in the future, we would supply a template. Um, there were two clear classes of submissions uh, uh, that we didn't anticipate. So we were focused mostly on the software and we were hoping to capture those artifacts. But there were some submissions that were really focused on the science. Uh, and so they just happened to use some piece of software. And what we saw was multiple submissions with the same piece of software focusing on different scientific questions. So in the future, what is kind of suggested is maybe two different tracks, you know, one science focused and one uh, software focused uh, and kind of reviewing those separately. Uh, and then the reviewers, uh, again, uh, it's kind of important to have both aspects that scientific uh, knowledge as well as the technology knowledge as well, which can be a little tricky. Uh, and so we ended up having a mixture of both. Some folks that kind of touched on both aspects of that. Um, but uh, the, having folks that are aware of both uh, was pretty important. So I'll, I'll end it there. Uh, and again, we're hoping to do this again. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Kenton. Um, so again, does anybody have any 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 immediate questions at at this at this point? Uh, I have a question, which is sort of what you then alluded to, which is the science versus software best practices and I, I think that's that's also true for scientific software in general that some are very science focused and sort of they don't really care about sort of the practice that make make life easier and make software more maintainable um you said you might do two different tracks in the future is there also something about sort of i don't know maybe it's an educational aspect or something that 
people feel more familiar with the science but need some hand holding with notebooks and that it's not really one or the other but it has to be uh, sort of a combination um so so i don't know if you continue this is that something you 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 thought about of how you um there's interesting science of how you make the notebooks let's say more reusable because it's sort of easier to just adapt to your needs etc and it's also that you make sure it's still around two years later and, and runnable etc yeah, that's that's a good question, and uh, a big part of what the office uh, and with the leadership committee of EarthCube have been doing, and, and just finalized, uh, was basically a document. Kind of, it started out as a kind of a description of the standards and practices for EarthCube, but what it really ended up being was best practices, uh, and it kind of outlines uh, some of those aspects: is you know, where, what should you do with your code, how should you document it, uh, leveraging things like Docker to containerize, you know, the environment, things like that. And so there's that there is that aspect as well of you know, kind of. Uh, addressing that. I would say with regards to the, the main motivation, at least for me, with regards to separating out a science track and a, in a software track was, uh, you know, reviewing papers, you know, as part of, you know, our scientific careers as well. When you see the same thing coming in again and again and again, it feels like it's a duplicate paper, but it's, you know, in the case, duplicate software. And that seems strange, but it's different scientific questions. And so that, that it kind of seems strange to me. There was, as we were seeing the same software coming in and again, again, and again, and again. Uh, and so I think this would alleviate some of that, a little bit of awkwardness with regards to that is uh, it's different scientific questions. So it's very relevant. Um, uh, it's just uh, happening to use the same software. Thank you. All right, great. Okay, so it's, uh, we have, I think about 40 minutes left at this stage. Um, what I've been trying to keep up, you know, people have been putting in, filling in notes and so on like this so far, but we're just moving on to the discussion. And again, if it's okay, we'll just kind of do it pretty much in the same order as the, as the, as the topics that are, that are, that, that, that in the order that things were, 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 were spoken about. Um, so I, I, I've kind of just been talking with the, with the, with the speakers and, and, and so on. We're just trying to put together some, some, some questions. So the first topic that we have here, and, and just to know, we're not gonna try and have breakout groups or whatever. I think it's for this number, we can, we can just have, a, have, have, this, have this discussion here. So getting back to um, Martin's, uh, uh, Martin's talk, I think it's kind of interesting that Martin's point in terms of saying, okay, Notebooks is software, basically. Okay, let's stop, stop, stop worrying about it. And I've sort of seen lots of fairly, well, what I would call fairly tortured discussions about what is, what is, you know, really, what is a notebook? Is it this? Is it that? And so on. And I think it's also interesting the way um, um, what 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 Kenton is is talking about. And I mean, this is one thing I kind of wanted to 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 throw out there. Should we be thinking about trying to classify different types of notebooks. I mean, we've, you know, you're seeing one example there of science heavy versus sort of, you know, novel science rather than and, and, and novel software. Do, do we think that there are other, you know, different types of classes of notebooks that, 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 that can be done or, you know, can they, could they, can they be classified or is this kind of an exercise in futility is, is the, is, is the bottom line there. Um, what are people's thoughts on that? What would be the purpose of that, Hugh? I mean, I, um, yeah, sure. No, that's it. That, that's a, no, it's a, it's a, that's a good point. Um, I think it's, number one is, is, uh, we're we're already, as we've seen with the the EarthCube project, we're in the, the situation where it's actually useful if 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 one could sort of say, yeah, I'm submitting a uh, a, a notebook which is talking about science, whether the, where the novelty is in, in the science or the novelty is in the in the in the software. I've seen um, if we talk about Enol's work, we have uh, other cases which are. We have notebooks which are more like a front end to to a to a to a data set, you know. Um, Kirstine Patrick has as Kirkpatrick has has suggested that uh, notebooks can also be seen as a thing which sort of like uh, bridges that gap between 
um, the command line interface to a computing resource and a nice GUI, you know, that kind of just web page to, to access stuff. And then, then it's, it's, it's more configurable between the two. Those are sort of four different examples. They have four very, very different kinds of, of, of goals. And um, I, I, the thing I was wondering about is are people in the first instance, are we, when, when we get into these very, very long and tortured discussions, what is a notebook? If we at least are able to disambiguate things, then you know you, you, we can say, oh, okay, yeah, this is this type of notebook. It feeds in and, and yeah, here's the sort of appropriate avenues that are there. Now, I, I think the thing that's asking is, is it, is, is it possible to do that kind of enumeration? Does anybody think that or is, is again, is it, is it just like, no, you, 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 we can't make up our minds at this stage? Well, I might throw in one more thing is I, I meant to mention this with Martin's question uh, is uh, with regards to notebooks and he mentioned archival uh, aspects of it, you know, preserving the, uh, so it's runnable uh, is uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that's uh, services. Uh, and so how do you capture that? So 10 years from now, can you run that notebook that's calling an external API on some service somewhere? Uh, and from an archival perspective, that's a tricky question. Yeah. Yeah, 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 uh, and that's something that's kind of what 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 Patricia has been has been sort of has been has been has been has been leading on to there. So, um, um, Martin, um, do you I'm kind of do you have any 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 thoughts here, or you know, are we just overthinking this? <laughs> well, I was more thinking of the sort of spectrum between the narrative and the the code. Yeah. While this is sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, I, I think it's closer to to code right now. It might change over time, but I see it's sort of uh, most people that experiment with new environments for for writing, for example, scientific articles. It's usually you put in uh, the 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 notebook in a, in a smart way that your figures are automatic generated, etc. That yeah. it's a full writing environment. I think we're not quite there yet. That's why I said maybe closer to code. But also, at the end of the day, I don't really care. I think notebooks are so popular that they have a sort of are distinct. Um, and that's enough for me, um, which is not your, your question about sort of different kinds of notebooks for different yeah. terms, but really more where they fit in the sort of the bigger picture of scientific outputs. And yeah. what I found interesting in Canon's presentation is, of course, what always happens, and also with, with software, is that you write a software paper because that's sort of whether it's in JOS or somewhere else, to make it more sort of following the norms of the community of this is science. It has to be a paper that describes the software if you want this to be cited rather than the notebook itself. And that's sort of, that's a pellet that's also common. There's data papers and, and other kinds of things. Which okay. for me, it's just that we are in a transition. All right, all right. So does anybody else have, have, have other thoughts on 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 that on that question. So you just I mean from my perspective I think that I, the the conversations when they start to get tortured because they want to define notebooks I don't think that that's helpful. I do think that all of the use cases that you laid out and the and the context in which they're used and how they're used is incredibly interesting. Um, yeah. And I could imagine you know the work that you do when you do training that you're sort of laying out different ways to use those notebooks. Um, so I think it's the use cases that are interesting, less so than the idea of trying to define a notebook type or something. Okay, so so there's, so in that respect, there's, there's kind of room to say, oh, okay, actually trying to, to enumerate different types of, 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 of use cases of, of notebooks and say, yeah, here, are, here, here's what, here's what we see kind of out there in the, in the, in, in the wild is something that's, that's there. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 th thanks very much. Okay, um, excellent. So if it's all right, um, we'll kind of move on to uh, Martin. If unless there's something else that you wanted to kind of talk about specifically there, I'll, I'll kind of move on to the stuff with respect to to, to Patricia. If that's all, if that's all right. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, uh, rather than me being. Uh, me being very woolly there, uh, uh, Patricia had some sort of really clear uh, um, questions in terms of the work that's there. In terms of uh, herself and 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 Rosie, 
kind of have you know that they 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 they're sort of running into sand even though it's an interesting project and i've kind of been in in the calls you know loads of people have been saying yeah this is really good and really interesting so um and she had kind of has very very three three very very clear questions which is number one um how you know what's the best way to uh, do do people have ideas for for funding this project um josh i don't know you just written something in the chat is this talking about sloan thank you very much uh is that is that relevant pertinent to this to this particular question or, or is it is it on something else no it was uh on a previous thread that i was oh. um just logging something that that was relevant okay no worries at all so sorry josh i'm not looking at you. oh yeah obviously you're going to, to try, but you know um i mean it's it's is does any people do, do people have um for a project like this, which is which is which is fair, fairly small scale, does anybody have any sort of ideas on um, uh, funding sources that could that that that, that could support a, a project like like that? And again, I'm, I'm not looking at you, Josh, in particular, but you know, just just uh, just just looking for 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 ideas for what 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 people might have have at this point. Um, so I can't uh, speak to the archival section, but I can say that I've just recently put in a proposal to the government of Canada to hire a staff member to look at um, connections between data sources and um, notebooks and other uh, and, and the VRE community. So the idea yeah. here is because I represent the World Data System and we have a lot of data providers, I want to make sure that our data assets are available. And you know, when I look at this talk, by the way, all these talks were ex excellent, excellent talks. And it really gave me a lot to think about, but I don't know that traditional data repositories have a clue how to um, make their data available in a way that a notebook would want to consume it. And so that's something yeah. I'd like to start looking at. So if I do get funded, then maybe in March, I'll have a dedicated staff member who can start looking at some of these things. But you know, nobody knows. Nobody okay. Knows. Okay, so so so, but we'll knock on your door in, okay. in March right? <laughs> and say, "Hey, yeah." <laughs> okay. Um, so so, any other any other uh, sort of sort of like, thanks thanks for that very much, Karen. Any are there any other thoughts uh, at this point on the on just on just on just on that point there? Not not very concrete, but I um, I spent a lot of time uh, last few months on sort of in the context of. EOS, so European grant funding on um, working on what is needed for research infrastructure. The focus was Hi. basically totally uh, on the... Um, kind of just talked about how you actually adjust the view of 3D rendering, because that's one of the, probably one of the challenges of 3D rendering. Hello. More just, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, that was a bit odd. Um, sorry, Martin. Do you want to say that? Say that. Oh, say that so one more basically time. Basically, this was thinking about what is needed for research software in in, in the European infrastructures, and obviously yeah. a lot. The focus was, I would say, almost hundred percent on source code because that's obviously the first step. If you don't preserve it, everything is lost. But I think we sort of touched on the discussion of that's not enough. You have to do the next step, and of course, the big picture is you have. I don't know, containers and everything can be executed again in 20 years. But I think the notebook is a, is a small step beyond the, the code. And I think that's sort of for the preserving notebooks and having things that can still run. Uh, that sounds like a good next step in this direction, which means um, there was nothing concrete. But if, if, uh, if you're still in Europe, Patricia, maybe there's opportunities that come up <laughs> in the next few years. Or I don't know whether Scotland counts as that, uh, but that I, I think with notebooks doing that next step feels much easier than some of the more complex computing environments that you have to reproduce and preserve. Okay, so just asking Martin, is that like things like the co the EOS co creation fund and stuff like that, or is it is there? Oh, this was more thinking what calls should be made uh, in 22, 23, whatever. And it was okay. not detailed enough to say we need a call going out for preserving okay, <laughs> for the notebooks. And I could can put a link to the document that describes this, which goes in a very different direction, but just for context. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, uh, oh, well, I'm being a bit indiscreet. Uh, we kind of, uh, it's actually part of a EOS co-creation fund. And that was quite, that was, 
a lot of work uh, for for a small sum of money, but never mind. Um, I'll tell you about that over a few drinks. Um, <laughs> okay, so if it's all right, I'll I'll sort of if it's okay, um, unless there are other suggestions. Um, there, thanks, uh, 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 thanks to you all for that. So I, just... I should just just really briefly, given that I'm here in the room. I mean, I should say, you know, this is an area Sloan has been working in. Send us a letter of inquiry and. Um, and uh, that's always what well, I would say, both for this project, but in general, there's a very small world of people who are thinking about longer term archiving and preservation of software generally, and an even smaller universe of people who are thinking about notebooks in particular. Um, the, for what it's worth, what I've tended to see is people starting from near term stabilization using containers and Docker and things like that, and then pushing towards longer term archival standards as opposed to projects that have tended to like really think about archival workflows as they're traditionally understood and then moving them towards software. I don't think it's an either or project, but I've seen fewer people from the more conventional archiving world thinking about using those tools as opposed to folks using um, uh, Biffler or some of the other, um, uh, so, some of the sort of, you know, emulation archiving, ba emulation based yeah. archiving frameworks. Um, and, and then thinking about what are the metadata standards, things like that. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think it's a, I'd love to hear more. All right. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Josh. Uh, brilliant. Um, okay. So if it's all right, I'll, I'll just to move on to the, the kind of the next question, which is, um, uh, if, if, if money doesn't work, how does, how about charm? Uh, uh, in other words, uh, our, our, as as Patricia put it better, um, you know, it's is we have people who are clearly interested, but it's just like it's just not on people's prior. You know, they they, they just can't prioritize the time at least right now. Um, how you know can can people looking at this do, you, do you think there's a a better way to 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 pitch it and sort of say yeah this really sort of fits in 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 what you're doing you're doing you're doing now um, does anybody have any thoughts there on that I, I think that was one of the driving factors and it was a colleague of mine Clara Narsted uh, who brought this up is make it in the interest of the scholar in terms of tenure and things like that and and, and so that was the what she was kind of motivating us with regards to that um, peer review. Uh, as a way of motivating folks, but then it's on their CV. You know, it's a published artifact that you know, when yeah. go, and you're maybe someday, you know, it's a, it's a piece of that. And so that was kind of the thought there. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a very good. That's a that's a that's a very good point. I think so far we've been kind of talking to people uh, like um, who are very much from the archiving community and 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 so on. And I think there's that there's a thing we're kind of saying. Oh. Um, yeah, we do this, and actually, there could be, you know, there would be a paper that might come out of that, and so on. So there's that kind of direct grab in there. We hadn't thought about how to 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 say to academics, you know, people who just use notebooks, oh, okay, if you do this, this is this is this this would this would this would this would work. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's 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 certainly a that's certainly a, that's certainly a very very good point that you're that you're making here. Um, does anybody have any any other ideas at the, uh, on that? One one small point that I just want to like underscore in the EarthCube um, in, in the story of that that pilot, one of the things that I was most excited to hear was that you got Esor to expedite being able to handle notebooks as an object because I actually think there's a question about sort of putting putting notebooks in a, a, a formal workflow. But I also think there's a tremendous amount of interest in forms of gray literature. There's a surge in, in attention to preprints right now. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of generative activity and a lot of open space where you can get people's attention um, in the contexts of, you know, preprint servers, working paper servers, things like that. Um, these sort of, you know, catch-alls for, for gray literature. And I'm per personally, I'm actually quite excited to see the movement of notebooks into those spaces um, alongside what I think we've seen a bit more, which is the movement of snapshots of notebooks via, you know, via as an auto snapshot or something into static data archive, you know, snapshots into data archives. Um, I think the notebook maybe is a little more of its, of its, you know, of a family resemblance with other kinds of like 
narrative gray literature, but the platforms haven't really been able to handle them natively yet. So it's it's exciting to hear AG you made that move. Okay. All right. That sounds that sounds sounds great. And, and just to add to that, yeah, from what we understood, it was, it was on the roadmap, uh, but they actually accelerated it. I, I I would like to say because of us to help us, but <laughs> I don't know that. Um, uh, but one aspect that did come, become clear too is to really make these notebooks useful, you really need uh, computational environment around it, data storage as well. And so it's not just the notebook. Uh, and so in the geoscience world in the US, there's a, I, I think it's just the US, that there's an effort called Pangea, which is trying to you know, do some of those things. Uh, and those seem interesting uh, in terms of uh, doing a little more in terms of allowing people to use these notebooks. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, this is, this is all really interesting, uh, but I, I just, I, I appreciate that time is sort of ticking by. So if it's all right, I'll kind of just move along. Um, the other question that Patricia was asking was, um, do we need a, a do, do, should there, is, a, is there a need to change the plan in, in some respect? Is this, is this the wrong direction? It sounds to me as if, um, oh, see you later, Josh. Um, it sounds to me as if people are saying, no, what, what, what Patricia and Rosie is doing is, is, is really good. Uh, uh, just find a way to, 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 to make it happen. I, 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 I think, but you might have other, uh, to, you know, uh, the idea of taking notebooks and running it through the standard archiving software as a first step. Um, people seem to agree that that's a, that's a good idea. Am I, am, am I getting the right vibe there? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> okay, so if it's all right, um, I'm gonna kind of move on to, uh, so we've got 20 minutes left, well, in fact, 19 minutes left. So if it's okay, we'll move on to, to Enol and in particular talking about HPC and, and, and so on. So uh, Enol, if I've picked up these points wrong, please uh, contradict me. So um, the first one is, is, if there's anybody here who are, within who are attending here um who are involved in hpc you know do, do do people have any sort of stories or of use of interacting with notebooks um it's leslie wyborn hey leslie i'm here i'm sure people at nci would um would have national computational infrastructure. Yeah. In Australia would be interested. It's just that uh, the key person who wanted to come to this couldn't get to this one. Yeah. Um, so I'd just sort of reserve a spot and then we can get back to you if we don't want it. Yeah, great. I um I haven't put my email down on anywhere here, but but you should be able to, you know, I'll, 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 yeah. let me, I'll put it, I'll pop my email in here as well. If you, if you, you know, if, if you want to pass anything on, yeah, that would be, that would be fantastic, Leslie. And then, or even, yeah, just contacting Enol directly as well. That would be, that would, that would be really good. Okay. Um, I have a sort of slightly different question. So for the things I'm interested in, mostly metadata, that's sort of not so heavy and I don't need HPC, but do we think that the general trend for notebooks is to run them in the cloud because it's just so much more convenient and easier now and sort of the lone person running it on their desktop is not, yeah, not dying out, but that's not the main use case anymore or will not be just like everything else moves to the cloud and that we should think uh, sort of when we discuss this that it's, it's really a, a shared environment, whether it's HPC for these kinds of data or just for convenience and making it easier to share tools. And what is the feeling? If, if I don't know whether I made myself clear, because I run most notebooks just on, on my desktop, and that's fine in terms of compute, and I can share them with version control, etc. But that's a, that's still a hurdle for many people to set up the environment and and all that stuff. Well, I mean, if I can jump in, uh, so I've used. Binder and Colab and stuff like so stuff I do with notebooks, it, I tend to yeah I do it on my note on my on my on, on my laptop and just and and do that. Um, for teaching, um, I tend to use it to use Colab or Binder or or whatever simply because 
I don't trust, you know, my department server to run, you know, 150 instances of of a of a of a notebook all at the same time. I, if I know I can just kind of go, yeah, it's fine, and just and just let them let them get on with it. That's a very, you know, there's that kind of very very practical. Now that's sort of a a, a specialist use case, although. Actually, I think that's one thing that we haven't been talking about is 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 education and how 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 notebooks are used in education, which I think is 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 pretty awesome as well. Um, but yeah, that's so it's a uh, it depends on depends on the on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. If if I may add here, I think also we have seen requests for notebooks mainly when you want to share with others so notebooks hosted notebooks in a, in a cloud let's say when you want to share or, or do these kind of training events where you want to make sure that everyone starts from the same place and you don't want people to install things in their laptop and that you cannot really control so people will have different libraries and, and you will run into trouble sooner or later so Having this kind of cloud service is, is really convenient for, for trainings, tutorials, and so on. And also for, for sharing. That's that's at least from the EI point of view, that where, where we are seeing more more demand or, or requests. Yeah. I get yeah, I guess the other thing is yeah, that 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 other thing that um, if if it is up on the cloud, then the then at least for that instance. The, the all the environment is is all there you know all the right libraries all the data that you know and it's 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 it, that's 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 what's really key i think yeah um okay uh um okay you should have the same environment okay that's that's great um so again i'm sort of pushing the pace all the time um so uh apart from um, uh, Leslie, thanks again for that comment. Um, is there anything on the HPC users, any other thoughts there? If not, I think I'll kind of move on to the other question that Enol wanted to ask, which was, um, again, it's kind of getting back to preserving things, which is what's, you know, if they were, if, if, we're thinking about notebooks that run for for HPC. What are the things that that are really really important there, in terms of the data sets that sit in the, the the notebooks, or trying to capture the computational environment and so on? You know, if I've kind of picked that up in the wrong way, please 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 say so. But you know, do do, do people have thoughts about what kind of prior what what they like to see in that in that in that in that priority? <coughs> Okay. So well, yeah, it, I, I can yeah. chime in a little bit on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think data sets is a big one because you know when you're dealing with large hundreds of terabytes, petabyte data sets, it's it's not really tractable to download that and do something you know on your on your laptop. Uh, and so having some place where you can uh, do the analysis that your notebook is doing is is, is essential. Uh, going back to your previous question about the cloud, is that you know we do see a lot of that. It's becoming you know every it's everywhere now. Uh, and so these environments that are supported by the cloud, these interactive environments versus these batch kind of queue environments are, are, are pretty useful for these kinds of things. But basically, yeah, providing some place where the data can be housed without having to download it and do the computation on it uh, seems pretty important, especially with the direction things are going you know, with bigger yeah. data sets and uh, bigger analyses and things like that. Okay, okay, right, right. Yeah, which kind of leads back to that thing, the conversation we were having about that use case of uh, the the notebook is more or less like a front end to 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 a data set. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's 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 cool. Something uh, I have seen is uh, privacy as another issue where it's safer to keep it in the cloud environment instead of and and the worst is of course the combination of very large data with privacy, which is for example patient genomic data that it's. It's much easier to manage this uh, central place and give people access to whatever they should access rather than, oh, you can download the data. It's not only hard to handle, but it, it, on a, sort of on the sides, but it's really a, a total nightmare with privacy. And that's probably also true for other disciplines where 
and on environmental sciences, you might have sensitive data in maybe in biodiversity, maybe it's not so common, but I think there are good reasons to keep the data um, maybe open, but maybe a little bit more controlled for some kinds of data. And then that's a good approach. Okay, so again, that the, that the notebook is housed on the cloud, basically co-located with the, with, the, with, the, with the data, and then you're kind of just interfacing through that, okay. And it might also be something as simple as embargo data. You don't want to get scooped until you're, you know, done with it and published and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Embargo data. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, okay. Those. That's actually kind of kind of an interesting point there for 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 you. You know, just you know, one thing that's 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 there. Um. Okay. So we got ten minutes left at this stage. So, um. At this stage, we'll just uh, um, move on to the uh, onto the, the 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 last part, which is Kenton's Kenton's talk on on the publishing on the um, the exercise that was there. Um, so, what were the questions? So, these were things that actually it was what Dan Dan Katz actually who couldn't make today uh, session. Um, so he had two questions, although I, I think the second one sort of echoes similar points. So, the, the, but the first one is kind of interesting one, which is uh, what would be needed to make peer review of notebooks as easy as possible? So, okay. Uh, what, are, what, are, what, are, what would people's thoughts be here? Well, it starts with a horrible experience if you use version control. And if you're not very careful, it's basically unusable. And I think there's both commercial and free tools to sort of filter out the, the noise that you mm -hmm. can actually look at, 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 the, at the code with, as, with human eyes. And I think, I, I'm not sure, I think people have their workarounds, but it, I, I think it's fundamentally, I mean, talking about Jupyter notebooks. Yeah. Um, I think it's fundamentally <laughs> still not fully solved, at least uh, it's not sort of if I'm not mistaken, it's not sort of the standard setup but everybody uh, sort of has bypassed that. So things like uh, pull requests or just these basic things before you even go to full peer review, that's kind of painful. Right. And you do extra work, which of course there's many ways you do that. You can do that, but I feel that's, um, that's the first hurdle you have to take. Okay. So, okay, fine. Um, although I would, you know, I would have thought with peer review in some respects, you're sort of like Sage, here it is. That's the, that's the, here's the, here's the notebook with, with whatever bits and pieces. And it's like, you know, you don't have to worry about versions, but okay. That's, 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 that's fair enough. I mean, I kind of just, you know, if the, are we thinking about things like editorial guidelines? Uh, uh, would that make, uh, you know, if somebody says to you, like, here's a notebook, and then, uh, uh, but then you're told, okay, you're to be assessed according to these, to these parameters, do these, do these checks, like, go through every cell and make sure you press return and, and see, does it do, does it, does it, does it do stuff? You know, I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm being very naughty-ish, but, you know, uh, uh, would those, would that sort of, would those sort of guidelines be, be, be useful? You know, just, 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 just thinking aloud here. I think most of the reviewers did try to do that. I know I did. Uh, yeah. Make sure everything actually worked and was producing stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that was one of the bigger challenges when they didn't. Uh, that was kind of painful, you know, I'm trying to figure yeah. out why. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like, Reminds me of you know when I'm sort of like assessing student projects. Uh, it's like oh here's the code, and then it, the report is brilliant, but then the code just like doesn't do anything. <laughs> like do I trust any of this? You know, <laughs> it's a, it's the is the is the is the line there. Okay, um, okay. So are there any other thoughts? Again, we're we've got about six minutes left at this stage, so we're just uh, there. Oh, okay, Janet, you got. I think they should review according to the manuscript for each section plots tables, the notebook should should respond that. Okay, great. Um, oh, and Karen, you also had some some points there. If it's okay, I'll 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 pop that into the notes as well. Um okay, so uh just a few minutes left. Um how should the other point 
that Dan asked was how should notebooks be archived so they can readable and runnable in the future? Um, uh, that I think is a very open, <laughs> that, the thing I, I would say is that's a very open question, but maybe people have thoughts at this point on that. I thought we had solved this when we talked about yeah. uh, archiving 20 minutes ago. Yeah, exactly. So, so we just, so yeah, Patricia, get to work. Um, <laughs> um, Give your money and then we'll be sorted out in a few years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, I think that was also comment by Josh about sort of the network resources that seems to be this, I mean, of course, also the tools and code change, but basically that the notebook is fetching stuff from all kinds of places that this will quickly break down. It seems to be one big hurdle. And I think there was a reference to a project in the chat, but I haven't, I'm not sure I didn't know that. Yeah, okay, fine. All right, all right, that sounds- But if the notebook is, if you have all the data, and it's not about fetching data from various places uh, as a first step, that I think it becomes easier with preserving because then it's just, Here's the data, and here's the uh, computation on them, and that that is all to change. But that's easier um, to preserve, I think, than missing dependencies on things that, yeah, they're just external resource you can't control. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Okay. Just, just yeah. think on that. Maybe there should be kind of a classification on on how easy to preserve is a notebook. So let's say. We have these kind of notebooks that are easy to preserve because they don't fetch data from the outside world. So we can handle that, those in, in some certain way. I'm not an expert, so and these are easy to handle, that's it. Those that fetch data from external sources, maybe there, there are some further classification that you can do saying, okay, this is fair data. So in principle, it will be accessible in the future given certain conditions, other, you can say this notebook will never be able to preserve because we know it's impossible that you, I don't know if that's useful for, for kind of an archiving, archiving um, kind of procedure or process that, that may be put into place. Yeah, okay. You know, yeah, that's it. That, that, that is a good point. I think I have vague memories from the Helsinki session last year where people talked about like a bit, um, that, that we might need some terminology to describe notebooks, either how complex they are or um, just, you know, yeah, how, how worth it is to preserve them content-wise um, as well. So I think like that's the other thing that um, 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 archives usually have like criteria for when something goes in. And I don't think we do have an idea yet for you know what would make a a, a notebook um, especially worth preserving. So, yep, right. complexity um, and which workflow it requires, plus then um, actually classical um, selection criteria. I think definitely something that would be a next step if we um, have first trial figure out in in the, the, uh, the preservation bit. Okay. I wonder if that's something code meta could maybe capture. Yeah, but then you capture metadata that describe whatever you did, but which is important, but is that enough? Yeah, I don't know. Well, Definitely a starting point, I would say, you know, see so like how much you can tell from code meta of how, how that behaves in a preservation system. Like Worth for example, a shot. I mean, you know, for me, the uneasy one is it does it call an external service, you know, that makes it, you know, jeopardizes it in terms of longevity. Yeah. I mean, what I think, um, what is, I think notebooks are very much something that works and, and it's sort of everything that makes it more complex is, is, is sort of, has been pushed forward and that includes archiving. So I would think if you use notebooks for, I don't know, for your PhD thesis, that the first step would be you fetch all the data and then you archive this particular data set that you're working on with the notebook instead of just running the notebook, getting the data and really no way to 
make sure you get exactly the same data set when you run it again a month later. So that there's just a little bit more of sort of standard practices that yeah, notebooks are so easy that people probably just jump ahead and yeah. are archiving data, especially if it's a query. So sort of um, dynamic data, that's, that's also not easy. Sure. Okay. So um, ah, everything's, this is, the process is kind of, everybody's getting quite chatty now and we're just, we're just out of time. So um I just want to say, so at this page, if it's okay, I'm gonna we'll, we'll wrap it up at this point. Thank you all uh, for for coming along, um, and thanks specifically to to Martin. It's very late for you, sorry, Patricia. Well, it's thank about you. About the same time as for other people was called, so I don't feel any yeah. better. <laughs> and uh, uh, Enol, likewise, sorry, very late for you, Patricia. Almost as late. And Kenton, thank you uh, for, for, for short notice. Um, thanks everybody. We'll, I'll try and sort of put these together into some sort of notes and share these, share these, share these with you sort of going forward. All right. Um, so at this stage, I'll just, we'll just, we'll, we'll wrap it up at this stage. Okay. All right. Thank you all. And we'll see you all hopefully at some stage in, in real life. Okay. We'll hold on to that one. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Oh, you? Yeah. Before you go? Yeah, yeah. You, I've yeah, been copying the chat for you at the end of your document. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I, really appreciate I did miss about 10 minutes in the middle. So if you want to take another complete copy, because once you drop it out, once you get out of Zoom, you lose the chat. Okay, great. Actually, I've been copying it, but there was about a 10 minute thing where my connection dropped out. Okay, so okay. I, great. Yeah, I've just I've just saved that now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, yeah. Leslie. I really appreciate that. No problem Thank you. at all. All right, take care now. Bye bye. Okay. Talk to you later, Patricia. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.